Welcome back uh, to the Trauma Talk series. Now the next uh, conversation for this morning is between Gabor and Stephen Porter. Stephen, I really want to thank you immensely for being for accepting our invitation. It's been such a pleasure to to relate to you, and we deeply look forward to more. So thank you, thank you for being here. It's such an honor, Gabor. I think you wanted to introduce our guest, so yeah. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. This is a pleasure to meet you face to face, at least through the Um, internet. And you made a wonderful product. I really enjoyed the movie very much. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. It means a lot to us for me. Thank you. Hello, Stephen. So nice to see you. Hey, hello. Hello. Welcome to our home. Yeah, thank you. Welcome to my home. Um, So I would like to introduce you to our audience. Yesterday, when I was asked what I would do differently about this movie or what, I, what is missing for me, what is missing for me is the voices of the people, the many people, but some salient ones that I've learned so much from. And you, of course, uh, the leading one amongst them. Um, your work on uh, really the wisdom of the body, I might say, mm-hmm. uh, including the wisdom of trauma about how our nervous system um, either resists or integrates a trauma, either um, separates us more from ourselves or actually helps us heal. And I'm not going to go into the mechanisms now, but your work has largely been on the vagus nerve, uh, vagus meaning the wandering nerve, like in vagrant, really. And it's been absolutely a seminal work. Um, your work has changed the practices and the understanding of multiple tens of thousands of therapists and psychologists around the world and nobody in the future will be able to talk about the regulation of the body um, or the impacts of trauma without referring to your work and particularly through the polyvagal theory which I, I'll leave to you to explain but let me start with a, a question uh, and so I have two books in front of me one is your um, and I know you have a one, one just coming out now maybe it's already out but um, uh, the original polyvagal theory, which is not for the faint-hearted, I have to tell you, <laughs> it's very full of deep science and, and, and profound uh, research. And then I have the pocket guide to the polyvagal theory, which you kindly created as being a more accessible exp- uh, explanation of your of your views and findings. And I want to start with a quote from the pocket guide where you say on page 133 we wear our hearts on our faces so this is expression of wearing the hearts on our sleeves but you say we wear our hearts on our faces and i'm going to compare that to a a statement in the little prince by antoine de saint exupery which where the little fox says and now here's my secret the very simple secret the little fox says it's only with the heart that one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye so, Stephen, can you please talk to us about how we wear our hearts on our faces and how, yeah, I, and how it's impossible to see just with the eye? Well, it's a, uh, a, a marvelous question. First of all, thank you, Gabor, for inviting me and letting me be part of this, literally a celebration of heroic uh, proportions of giving voice to those who have been traumatized. And let me also say that watching the movie, I realized what courage you have expressed in your own journey, dealing not only with your own traumas, but how you translate that into being a helping person. Mm-hmm. And you know, we've had some discussions, but certainly not enough because we we share a Hungarian root. Yeah. And uh, except you know, my relatives left at the turn of uh, early 1900s. And we start thinking now about this transgenerational traumas. And my family was affected by a different one than yours. Yours was totally life or or death. And ours was really uh, oppression. So there's a different uh, transgenerational history, but we all, well, both of us have come through this with a deep desire to lessen the burden of suffering on humanity. Now, let me kind of play with the wonderful question you led with. And let me give you the new words that I would use. I would say that we broadcast our feelings and our physiological state in our voice. We literally broadcast that and we express it in our face. So those of us and those of us who are, in a sense, have 
dealt in the world of trauma, we see very instantaneously our body responds to another who has suffered uh, trauma, but not just in seeing them, but in feeling their facial expression and, and feeling their voices. Our nervous system evolved to detect those features. And we just have, in a sense, turned off our natural gifts of connecting with each other through voice and through expression. And we superimpose on that this pragmatic view that words carry meaning, only all the meaning. And they only carry a small aspect of the meaning of life. Our voice, our intonation, our facial expressivity are really the cues to tell the other person that we're safe to come close to and that we're there to help them co-regulate. So I, I love the fact that you found an antecedent for that, but there's even an earlier one. If you go to Chinese language and look at the word listen, it uses the symbols of ear and heart. Hmm. And we have to understand that to listen is to be embodied in being embodied in, in, in a sense, feeling the vocalizations of the other person. So listening is far more than hearing, and we have not, in a sense, given its true place. But in the world of trauma healing, we know the power of witnessing, the power of listening, because it's not only how our body responds, but our, as our body responds to the other, it's broadcasting those cues of accessibility to the person who's speaking. You know, there was a study last year, or maybe two years ago, I think they looked at electrical magnetic radiation coming from the hearts of client and therapist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they were incoherent and sometimes they were not. Yeah. But they were most incoherent. And when they were coherent, when they were in coherence, then later on, without the client or the therapist knowing what the measurements were showing, but those are the moments they reported as being the most meaningful. And, yeah. and, and particularly, they happened when the therapist was listening rather than speaking. Yeah. And on a simple, let's say, we don't have to get into a high level uh, uh, physics uh, lesson on this, but basically just visualize the, your heart pumping and blood flowing through your body in two different states, a state of feeling accepted and safe and calm, or a state of being uh, basically uh, marginalized and under threat. Mm. And just visualize which looks redder to you, which is warmer the state of, of calmness and accessibility. So we can reduce that. And we can say that as, even as we look at people's faces, we can see the coloration in their face, which is telling us a lot about the blood flow in their body. Hmm. Well, so, and one more point, you, you talked about words as opposed to emotional manifestations like voice and face in, 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 in your, in, the pocket guy you talk about you you call it a cortical centric world <laughs> yes i use uh, interchangeably uh cortical centric or cognitive centric it's uh the big brain metaphor we think that everything is due to intentionality due to learning and due to higher uh executive functions we do not re respect the more primitive bodily reactions of that are linked to survival and so if our body feels under a state of threat it kind of determines uh, all the higher brain structures, how they function. So mm -hmm. if we get our bodies mobilized into threat, we're not deep thinkers. We don't make good decisions. We can't solve big problems. And I think as our dialogue progresses, as our dialogue progresses over, let's say over years and uh, as we get more time to spend with each other, we'll see that our society is under a society that's under chronic threat. And that society shapes the individuals because the physiological state of individuals are now threat oriented and they can't utilize literally their evolutionary given privilege of co-regulating and feeling safe in the arms of another. Well, you know, I just had a conversation with Thomas Hubel about collective trauma and, yeah. uh, and you and I have had a bit of a conversation about this topic before when I interviewed you for the book about to be published next year. And you talked about the fear in society, but just to get a bit more specific, um, uh, you look at certain politicians and, uh, but, but almost any of them really, you know, there's a famous story uh, in uh, Oliver Sacks wrote a, in his, uh, the man who mistook his, wood for a hat, his wife for a hat, wrote about 
a group of aphasiac patients listening to watching Ronald Reagan on television, the president, the great communicator. And most of them are laughing and some of them are totally outraged. And Sachs asked himself, what is it? Is it that they don't understand Reagan or is it that they understand him all too well? Because not these aphasiacs who had a stroke and they can't understand the words, they're mm-hmm. reading the body language and they're seeing the inauthenticity. Yeah. So what is yeah. it that keeps most of us from seeing that, that we, we buy into the words rather than uh, well, the, the comment? There's another Reagan story, and it's yeah. about if you listen to the words or listen to the face without the words. And yeah. the issue is, or listen to the words without the face. Uh, <laughs> if you listen to the words without the face, the the speech sounds broken and almost incoherent in places. The mm. issue is our nervous system is such an integrated a unit that it uses the visual to integrate what's missing from the auditory. Mm. So it actually puts it together. So in the case of people with specific you know disorders following stroke, they couldn't that integration wasn't working for them. So they were picking up the specifics based on the intonation of vocalizations. Mm. No. So with that introduction, I'm going to ask the big one. Tell us in five words or less, what the heck is polyvagal theory? I don't mean five words or less, but I mean for an audience that isn't necessarily scientifically trained. Well, I, I, those, I mean, first of all, I, I always say that's the, the question I like the least because okay. it really depends upon how much time we really have. Uh, yeah. But let's start off with what I think is one of the major take home lessons from the theory and that is our underlying physiological state shifts uh, our perspective of the world so if our body's in a state of mobilization or fight flight we see the world more negatively yeah. if our body is calmer through this newer vagal regulation of our of our autonomic nervous system we see the world optimistically if we're shutting down with an ancient vagal circuit where we're dissociating and immobilize and we are literally withdrawn from society we have no contact with the world so the first take home is that our physiology our autonomic state is this powerful intervening variable a word from graduate school that comes between the context that we live in and our responses to that context and if you step into the world of trauma people are telling you that they are dealing with a world that is threatening to them and that and they're literally telling you that their physiology is in a state of threat which it is and all the comorbidities that they describe including cardiovascular irritable bowel a variety of things that are clearly features of the autonomic nervous system not supporting homeostasis but when does the autonomic nervous system not support homeostasis when it's being diverted to deal with threat in a sense it's interfering with our homeostasis now our current medical world treats each of these disorders separately and tries to treat it when it's a neural retuning of the entire autonomic nervous system with a very powerful adaptive function of trying to enable that individual to survive survive using threat reactions so I would say that's the take home. Embedded in it is the fact that we have these three different physiological states, a state of calmness that supports our ability to engage each other or functionally to co-regulate with another person, a mm-hmm. physiological state that is uh, supports mobilization, but, be, but can be contained with that newer circuit for play. So we move and we smile at each other and we are co-regulated. But if we don't have the smiling, our movement leads to aggressive behavior and we have a shutting down defensive response but when we keep the social engagement system on board that immobilization response becomes moments of intimacy our body doesn't need to fight we are comfortable in the proximity of another so polyvagal theory identifies this evolutionary hierarchy that occurs and the newer circuits are basically our management circuit that when we're safe we we exploit utilize at the best our entire system let, me, let, let, me, let me jump in with a personal story okay and i want you to tell me what's happening okay for me okay so I'm, i've been married to ray my wife for 52 years and i i can experience her voice as loving and inviting and present and, and nurturing but sometimes i experience it 
as harsh and threatening and I want to shut it out. And depending on what physiological state I'm in, yeah. and it's not necessarily to do with what she's doing. Yeah. It's very much on my perception. So what's happening in my body in those two, two different states? Well, I would actually first start off by telling you how to manage that. And that is, that's a, a powerful clue to you that you're, in a sense, putting, your body is put into a state of defense, probably because you have a deadline, probably because you're trying to do too much, probably mm. because you're not honoring your own body's needs to mm. what we would now call self-compassion, the respect for your body needing things, and you're just pushing it. I mean, that, that much I know about you. So the, the issue is you're detecting these things with a bias. And potentially your wife may be saying, evaluating you and saying, literally, take care of yourself. And you're taking that now as a criticism and not as a reaching out to help you because you have an agenda and that agenda drives you. I mean, it's a good agenda, but we have to understand that even good agendas result in basically contra contradictions in being able to co-regulate with another human being. I'm married and I live in a world that has some of these features as well. And yeah. you have to become very respectful of your reactions to the other. And you can't interpret it from a level of intentionality. So the mm. fallacy of our culture is that as soon as we feel bad and we attribute it to someone else, our narrative yeah. says that other person had intended to be hurtful to yeah. us or should have been sensitive to us. And yeah. the answer is highly unlikely. So we literally have to become our own, let's say own parent in a way and observe ourselves and say, look, I'm feeling this way. Now, how do I manage that within the complexity of a social interaction, a marriage, a family, a work environment, a laboratory? Um, I used to go through this with my lab. I had a relatively large lab. And if a paper wasn't accepted or a grant wasn't funded, you know, it was visually uh, transparent in me. And I would realize that because my body went into these states and I would go to my lab and say, don't react to me because you may see something in my face and that this is what has happened now telling them had absolutely no effect mm -hmm. because they were the the potent cues were not my words the potent cues was my ability to be a supportive person in their lives and i was saying i now have an excuse for not being a so supportive person in your lives and they weren't buying that in a sense, in terms of the social interaction. And as parents, we have to acknowledge that that's what we're doing all the time with our children. Exactly. So physiologically, I may look like the same person ostensibly. Well, but let, 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 me, let me interrupt you on that. You yeah. may not look like the same person. I, I understand, yeah. Yeah. And the issue is we're Super, just not... Superficially, yeah. I may look like the same person. Yeah. But physiologically, yeah. I'm not the same person at all. Am I? Right. And we're not instructed to detect okay. those variations. We, yeah. in a sense, allow them to, <clears throat> to pass. So, you know, so my life, when I go back and look at older pictures of people, and I said, and you see the flat face the, around the eyes, you know, yeah. uh, you see a trauma face, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And now, when I look at these pictures and I say to myself, I should have known. You know, instead, I this is a part of my uh, kind of uh, dinner time discussions with with Sue, and that is, I used to interpret the flatness of people's faces as if they were thoughtful, they were thinking, not dissociative. I was misreading the cues, and it took me decades to figure this one out. So when a person's face is flat and they don't appear to be there, it's not like they're thinking about what you're discussing they're dissociating. And it often is related to, let's say, a bad history, a history in which there was some level of abuse or chronic stress. You know, when I look at photographs of myself from childhood, there's barely anyone on which I'm smiling. Well, I, I have the privilege, Gabor, of watching your movie, the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And when I came out of it, it was, you know, I, and I wrote to Maurizio, I said, you know, it really showed the, the heroic nature of the trauma survivor, but it mm. also showed the courageous Gabor. So mm. we, we, I saw your courage 
and it was in a sense an active it was not an act of pleasure or joy or exploration it was a battle you you were you were trying to fight a war and mm. it, so it so it says i'm going to juxtapose you to where i am since i'm not neither physician nor a therapist and mm. i didn't come into the world of trauma uh as a therapist or with a really severe trauma history but mm. i came into it through invitation uh, mm. because insight provided that in invitation and as i start to understand it i start to see in the people around me their history as it was being embedded in their gestures, in their voice, in their facial expressions. Hmm. Now, you talked earlier about um, smile, and uh, there's a certain politician smile that you know it's not genuine, because there's a kind of lack of coherence in the upper part of the face and the lower part of the face. Can you talk about that in terms of your polyvagal side? Oh, oh yeah. It, it's the upper part of the face is where the smile should be, not in the lower part of the face. Oh. In in fact, if you think about uh, how autistic individuals are often treated, they're told to smile, but the smile is using the the cheek muscles. And if mm. you understand the in a sense the evolution of the facial muscles, the lower part of the face is part of our aggressive system. It's for biting. You know, mm. it's with manuals. So when people do the false smile, we don't respond in a positive way. We almost feel like they are aggressive, which they are. Mm. I, I used to say, uh, put the hand up over the eyes or hand up over the mouth. And what are you seeing? What part of the face is moving? And the answer is the upper part of the face is linked to the nerves that regulate the middle, uh, the middle ear muscles that enable us to... Uh, emphasize human voice. So when we have exuberance in the upper part of the face, the middle ear structures tense and it dampens low frequency sounds where predator sounds evolved or used to come from. So we can now focus on social communication. It's also regulate those upper, the muscles of the upper part of the face and the middle ear muscles are regulated in an area of the brain stem that regulates this newer mammalian ventral vagus. And I'd like to just take one moment and say that the evolutionary journey from a asocial reptile to a social mammal is a story that we're talking about. It's a story that we're reliving uh, in, in the world that we're in. And that is where uh, virtually every reptile, every vertebrate has a cueing system, which I call neuroception, where the nervous system detects risk. They have one for, for, for danger or threat, and they react to that. But on this phylogenetic journey to sociality, mammals had a unique autonomic system, a neuroception of safety, and that required a changing in how we regulate our autonomic nervous system. We really have a reflex that turns off threat. I mean, it, it, if you want to think about a miraculous system, if the cues of safety are detected, uh, a baby stops crying. Hmm. A person who is upset if cues of safety are detected, they feel from being in a tense fight flight, their bodies now conform, they take the hug. So we have this miraculous system that basically downregulates defense. And this system also is anti-inflammatory. And now we start seeing what are some of the disorders associated with trauma, not just defensiveness, but inflammatory disorders and uh, autoimmune disorders. So, well, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen autoimmune diseases for a long time as, as responses to early threat. Yeah, yeah. Now, let me, so, uh, so a few things come up for me. I, again, uh, your thoughts come too rapidly. I have, but one is, I now understand that song, when Irish eyes are smiling. <laughs> it doesn't say when Irish mouths are smiling, when Irish eyes are smiling. Yeah, yeah. It, and, and when you hear the words, you visualize uh, this glow or exuberance in the upper part of the face. Yeah. And when you see that exuberance in someone, the child in the upper part of the face, we say, oh, that's wonderful. No, the second thing that came up for me was... Um, I forget what it was, so let me go to the third thing. Uh, the third thing that came up was that you talked, oh no, yeah, about safety. Now, you, a big emphasis in your work is on safety. And, and when I heard you in London once, you said something that really st uh, stuck with me. You said that 
safety is much more than just the absence of threat. He said yeah. safety is the presence of connection. Yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that? Oh, yeah. I think, again, culturally, we have things wrong, and we think about removal of threat as the basically what we need. Removal of threat isn't bad. I'm not saying that. I'm yeah. saying, but it's not sufficient. Yeah. So, in a sense, when we deal with schools and we start having uh, metal detectors and teachers with guns, it's sending cues that are not cues of safety. Our nervous system evolved with this capacity to downregulate threat reactions with cues of safety. Those are voices that have intonation, gesture. And in the world of therapy, we talk about being present, we talk about witnessing. We talk about shared moments or shared intimate moments of intimacy or shared, even shared attention. Uh, it's when, uh, or what you were talking about, two bodies co-regulating in space and time. That's, that's our nature. That's what we evolved to be. That's our biological imperative. So our biological imperative said that threat isn't good, but not enough. What made mammals different was this biological imperative. They had to connect. They had to co-regulate to survive, and we still do. So that brings me to my next question then, which is um, both about trauma and the nature of our society today. So yeah. first of all, one thing I realized is that as much as we're in communication with each other, people in the trauma field, uh, people that you and I know, you and I, we still have slightly different interpretations of the word trauma. I don't know that there's a common agreement. From my perspective, though uh, trauma can be both when bad things happen to people that shouldn't happen, but also when the good things that should happen don't happen. And for example, you, you talk about this biological imperative now for connection. Now, I don't know if you agree with me, but I'll posit that in our society, the way we're trained to raise children mm. is constantly cutting off or, or frustrating the need for connection. And, that, and the frustration of that need is in itself traumatizing. I think. What, what would you say about that? I, I, okay, I would start with what my definition is. And I think the yeah. definition is a, a has been poorly used. I, I tried when I created the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium at Indiana University, I basically went in and started to look at definitions of trauma for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the CDC and all these other places, including uh, ACEs work, were all event related. Yeah. And, Polyvagal theory says events are important, but the real issue is the body's reaction, the body's mm -hmm. response. Right. So if we take your your speculations, your speculations say that it can be a variety of external cues, but the critical thing is what happens in the body. Agreed, so, yeah. and, and so the issue is, does the body shift state into a chronic state of threat? Yeah. And I think that becomes almost operationally what trauma is. The body has been retuned. And we actually have now a lot of bit of data on this, including during the pandemic, uh, that uh, individuals who have, uh, let's say, child histories of trauma, adversity histories, when during the pandemic, and these are people who did not get infected, but looking at the psychological features, the more uh, adversity, the more autonomically reactive they were, but the trauma, the direct path from trauma history to worry and anxiety and depression during the pandemic went through whether or not their autonomic nervous system was retuned. So mm -hmm. if they had an autonomic nervous system that was already in a state of threat, mm -hmm. it's often related to their childhood history or developmental history, then those were the people who were reacting to the cues of the pandemic, the threat of the pandemic. So in a sense, that was their pre-existing condition. Wasn't the trauma, but was the retuning of the body to be defensive. That was their pre-existing condition. Hasn't the same thing been shown in post-traumatic stress disorder that, that people go through a difficult experience in adulthood, but it's the people who have been dysregulated previously that yeah. will develop yeah. the same thing with PTSD. So if one, uh, in a sense, de de deconstructed that, that you would say that their autonomic nervous system pre uh, was already retuned, creating a lower a vulnerability for yes. this triggering. 
In fact, uh, we're finding, I'm actually got interested in a clinical disorder known as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is Tell hypermobility. Me about, Tell me about and that. that. Okay, that's a, so supposedly a collagen disorder of hypermobility, yeah. double jointedness. However, it is a, a high co-occurrence of dysautonomia, meaning autonomic nervous system being destabilized. And second, the onset of the clinical features seem to be trauma related in many of them. Mm. So in a sense, they have a pre-existing uh, vulnerability, one could say based on this collagen disorder, but they're living their life fine. And then something happens and now they're their autonomic nervous system is dysregulated. They're suffering from chronic pain and they have their quality of life is poor. In our research, what we're finding is that their autonomic regulation is not just in a sense low vagal tone, which would be the metaphor that people would use, but it's poor vagal efficiency, meaning whatever vagal tone they have, they can't use it. It doesn't draw, there's a disconnect. So if we start building a different model of connection, so you and I live in a world where we say that connection is between people. And that's really an important part of the theory. But the theory is also saying there's an internal connection really where the brain and the body have to be co-regulating each other, sending cues back and forth. That's yeah. what's coming up with that measure of vagal efficiency. And with this autonomia, I should say with Ehlers-Danlos, that vagal efficiency is very poor. And in other research that we're doing, uh, people who have even a mild trauma history have low vagal efficiency. Mm -hmm. So this goes to your earlier point that, that it's the history that creates the vulnerability and then something else happens. Well, this is interesting because Ehlers-Danlos is considered one of these genetic diseases. But what, yeah. but what I hear you saying is that it could be genetic predisposition, but it still depends on environmental circumstances, whether it's the pain is yeah. I'm going to basically, I, we're doing a clinical trial to try to test, I would say probably the most controversial thing that I've ever done. And yeah. that is to try to decouple the autonomic, uh, uh, this, the dysautonomia from the disease. Right. And in a sense, I want to, in a sense, say that the disease itself, whether it's a pathogen or a genetic disorder or something occurs, in it itself is a threat stimulus to that nervous system, but not part of the disease. So when that threat mm. signal goes, the autonomic nervous system goes into this defensive mode and you get this whole cascade of symptomatology. But that cascade of symptoms is really not the disease. It's being triggered by the disease. And I'm in a sense proposing that we can intervene to stop that cascade. And if we can, the, the burden of suffering will be greatly reversed. But how do we stop the cascade? We, in a sense, learned from our evolutionary history that to turn off threat, we need to direct cues of safety to that nervous system. No, so, so, you, so that ought to begin in early childhood, shouldn't it? And uh, yeah. which stays, let, let me tell you again a personal story. So <clears throat> I've always known my dramatic history of, of, of Jewish infant of the Nazis, and I don't have to repeat it. But, but recently I was reading my mother's diary and I think I said this maybe the other day, but she's writing in her diary, I'm three weeks old, and she's saying, my poor little gubby, um, my heart is breaking for you because you've been crying for the last four and a half, but it's not time to feed you yet because I promised the doctors that I would feed you on a schedule. And so here's this woman who's her heart is really crying out to hold and, 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 and nurture the baby but she's following a cognitive-centric uh, doctor's orders. Yeah. Now, what's it like for, never, ne never mind trauma and Nazis and genocide, <clears throat> is a child, are we traumatizing infants? And I say we are, just by not responding to their cues where they need holding and safety. Well, let me uh, give you a simplistic developmental model yeah. that is shared across many, many mammalian species yeah. and that is co-regulation enables self-regulation to occur except right. in our society so uh -huh. in a sense what we're calling smothering or mothering or parenting is really exercises in co-regulation ask any parent that when you're uh feeding or dealing with your child how does it make you feel it's a co-regulatory experience it's not giving food to the individual it's the 
a shared feeling of support that you're getting, the conforming of bodies. And that gives the individual the neuroplasticity, or I would say even the boldness, the strength to go out on their own. So I think, especially if, like if you watch other mammals, like kittens playing or puppies playing uh, or rats playing even, they will go out and then they'll scamper scamper back to the mother, to, mm. to, to the breasts of the mother. And so it's part of this natural bit that you explore, but you have in a sense what was called the safe base to come back to. And as you mature, your explorations can go on for longer and longer periods. And you don't need the mother, but you need friends or you need a spouse and they serve or you need a dog. And a lot of people do it in that way. In a sense, you need an appropriate mammal to co-regulate with. Now, which brings me to another question. You mentioned play just now. And uh, <clears throat> Yak Pax, that the great neuroscientist, talked about the play system in our brains. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you talk about play as immobilization without fear. You you, you talk about it, how Mobiliza so mobilization without fear. Okay, mobilization without fear. Um, so just talk about the importance of play and and, yeah. and for human development, because that's another thing that we're depriving children of by giving well, them all these by giving them all these gadgets. We're deprived them of natural play, are we not? Well, we just think about the educational system, what got kicked out of it, recess, play, um, yeah. music. I mean, all the things that result in reciprocity of behavior. Play is systematic reciprocal behavior. And we have co-opted the word play and we think you can play with an object. It's different. So mm -hmm. play with an individual has all the cueing of intentionality and reciprocity and that's a complex neural exercise mm -hmm. and when i was in graduate school and i use this in my talks i showed two kittens playing and i reflect on what i was taught when i took comparative psychology and i was taught that uh, the cats were practicing hunting skills mm -hmm. but from a polyvagal perspective i looked at the pictures again and you notice that the claws are retracted, they don't break skin when they bite, and mm -hmm. above all, they maintain face-to-face -face interactions during mm -hmm. all the rough and tumble play. The face-to-face mm -hmm. -face interactions enable their nervous systems to know that the movements are not aggressive. Right. And that, in a way, defines play. And that's why many children who have, let's say, uh, spectrum features, are not really welcomed that much on the playground because they break face-to-face -face contact and people get hurt. So it's this understanding of the intentionality of movement that play gives us that skill set. It's a neural exercise. It's a neural exercise that enables the body to sit still to become cognitive centric for a while. So think about the school systems. They should be really emphasizing play during the first few years. Yeah. So the children develop that resource to self-regulate. And mm -hmm. instead they're being told to self-regulate without the neural resource. Wow. So that then leads me to the next question, which follows naturally. Uh, <clears throat> over the last several decades, we've had a preponderance in the diagnosis of children with a whole variety of so-called medical disorders. And I say so-called um, advisedly, but really what it seems to me, if I understand what you're saying, but much other research as well, what's really going on is um, increasing levels and different variations of nervous system dysregulation uh, that's a response to social conditions and 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 conditions in the homes rather than some intrinsic disorder yeah. of the child the nervous systems get retuned to a chronic state of threat yeah. and the manifestations are both mental health issues but also physical health issues and again there, this understanding of comorbidity even the use of the word is a misdirection the word really is telling us that our nervous system is being affect, being affected by the chronic demands on many levels. Um, you know, as a physician, here's the, the question I would probably ask you, and I already know the answer, and that is um, how much time was spent discussing neuroregulation of visceral organs? 
Can you see the zero? Yeah. yeah, I can see the zero. Right. And so there is no understanding of the bidirectionality of the visceral organ influencing the brain and even our thought processes, let alone our mind changing our physiological state. And so we don't have that, didn't have that information. So there was a disconnect uh, to that. But let me, let me ask you the other question. In terms of end organs, were you taught about how to assess damage to those organs? The damage, yes. Yeah, so blood tests and other stress yeah, tests. Yeah. So the end organ became the target of That's the diagnosis, right. not That's the right. neural regulation of the organ. Now, from a pragmatic point of view, wouldn't you speculate that before you had the end organ damage, neural regulation of that organ would be compromised? Well, absolutely. And, and even the word end, you know, at the end yeah. of what? It's the end of something, you know. It, it, it comes at the end of some process, but we never look at the process. Right. We don't have the process, and we and within medicine, uh, people yeah. talk about titration of levels, not in yeah. terms of the neural feedback of the levels. So the concept of a feedback loop is very distant or distal from the concept of medical care. Well, and of course. To go into medical training itself, it's highly dysregulating. It puts, medical training itself puts people in a state, state of stress and fear. Yeah, but there's a belief though, and that this is the right thing to do. Uh, yeah. When I was 17, I was an operating room orderly. Uh. So this was when I was going to become a physician, which I didn't become. But what I learned was that you can become numb to the feelings of others relatively yeah. rapidly. Yeah. And it was, in a sense, a part of that journey was to kind of understand what it was to become a physician. And part of becoming a physician was not to feel. It was uh, the num numbification of our ability to feel other. And in mm -hmm. doing that, we lose our ability to feel ourselves because we are a connected species. Do you happen to know James Doty by any chance? Yeah. Okay, so Jim Doty, you know, is a neurosurgeon, and uh, he wrote a book called The Magic Shop of the Heart. Yeah, oh, yes. And, and he told me a story once that, I mean, when you speak with him on stage, as I have, when he's moved, he'll just cry right on stage. So you have this huge, handsome neurosurgeon weeping on stage, you know. And, and he told me the story once that he cried once at a presentation, and the psychiatrist came up to him and said, you know, Dr. Doty, just come to me in three sessions, I can get rid of that for you. <laughs> Your capacity. I can get rid of your capacity to, to express to feel. Love. To feel, uh, it gets in the way. But doesn't our culture teach us that that yeah. we shouldn't uh, respond to our feelings? It starts in the classroom and it goes yeah. on and on. I mean, it, um, remember uh, what Nancy Reagan said: "Just say no." So, yeah. in terms of one's own, let's say, sexual drives, just say no. Turn it off. And yeah. then we start asking questions about, in a sense, with adults later in life, about their sexual function and how they deal with it. And you start finding out that antecedent conditions, such as childhood traumas, such as a retuned autonomic nervous system, impact on their intimacy. Well, let me end with another politician story um, and then open it up for questions to the audience. There was a very... Um, public display of what you're talking about when when um, Hillary Clinton was nominated for the presidency. And there was a film play about her life, narrated by Morgan Freeman. And uh, Hillary was saying that my mother really wanted me to be resilient. So when I was four years old, I was bullied by neighborhood kids. And I ran into the house looking for protection. And she said, there's no room for cards in this house. Now you go out there and deal with those bullies. Yeah. And he really thinks this is a wonderful bit of teaching. And I thought, oh my God, you know, yeah. uh, am I the only one in the whole world who's noticing that was being glorified here is the traumatization of a child whose vulnerability is being shut down? Yeah, well, I want to build on that, not with a political story, but I watched the original A Star is Born movie a couple of nights ago. It's a 1930s okay. movie. And okay. this young lady from a Midwestern town is going off to Hollywood to become a famous actress. Mm -hmm. And her grandmother tells her that when you want something, you're going to feel the pain of it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get hurt, but you have to keep going on and on.
and, mm -hmm. and so in a sense i was i've been watching old movies because i want to get a better understand i should say watching old movies during mm -hmm. the pandemic because mm -hmm. i want to get a better understanding of what was the world like that i was dropped into where did these cultural expectations come from and watching mm -hmm. movies tells you a lot of the treatment of others the treatment of feelings uh, mm -hmm. and especially the treatment of women this is really and, and people of color this is remarkable that we have this documentary literally of watching uh movies that tell us really how our society is so biased and literally violates the principles of what it is to be a human hmm well my next book is entitled for which i interviewed you is entitled the myth of normal trauma illness and healing in a toxic culture um so with that let me thank you so much for this conversation i could personally go on forever but i'd like to give other people an opportunity to pose their questions to you as well so zaya Maurizio, if you'd like to come back in and uh, and moderate that for us so well, thank you good boy wow thank you wow what a conversation so yeah to be heard two or three times for me to, to digest, digest. So, to digest. Rich. so rich thank you Beautiful. yeah uh, we have lots of questions about different conditions, uh, MLS, autoimmune disorders. You touched on that little bit already. Uh, what else we had? Uh, fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And people saying you do give some insights on autism from the point of view of polyvagal theory. What about these additional conditions? Well, well this, first of all, these are great questions, and they are actually uh, – it, telling you where I am going. So we are doing a clinical trial on Alice Danlos, but we're also doing a feasibility study on Parkinson's disorder. And we're using, in both those studies, we're using the safe and sound protocol, which functionally, which is an intervention I developed, but it's functionally an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. And in a pilot subject with Parkinson's, the person is now literally dancing. There's a video from his behavior change. And there's going to be a paper published in the psychiatric, uh, excuse me, the Harvard uh, Psychiatric Review of a case study of a young lady in Australia who had functional neurological disorders and was in a wheelchair. Now she's at school after five one hour sessions of listening to the Safe and Sound Protocol, which we can now deconstruct as saying, her body was in the state of threat. And when the body is no longer in a state of threat, what are the emergent properties? Uh, so we can start seeing these things occurring. Uh, with fibromyalgia, we have to start seeing many of these disorders that are now known as medically unexplained uh, symptoms because physicians just don't want to, don't know what it, what to do. I mean, they're pulling their hair out because they're not seeing it as a autonomic nervous system under threat. And if they get the system out of threat, these symptoms now would uh, be uh, it would dissipate. So fibromyalgia, chronic, chronic pain is another area. And to my great surprise, uh, a group of pain psychologists and surgeons, pain, pain physicians and spinal surgeons uh, were create a study group online on polyvagal theory because they said, this is what we're using now. We're not doing surgery because we found out that spinal surgery doesn't take pain away listening to people and supporting them uh, moves people into pain-free relatively rapidly. And I will tell you my own story. I hurt my back a year ago uh, in June during the pandemic. I twisted and I was in really chronic pain mm -hmm. and I was excruciating. But I was still, as I'm a trooper, I was still doing my webinars and I was online all the time. And I even did a full day workshop. And the interesting point was as long as I was online, engaged i had no pain it mm. was social engagement that was took me out of the pain it didn't cure me because i had injured something so it took several weeks for it to occur but with most people who have chronic pain they don't have an injury anymore it's a retuning of the nervous system to think that they're in pain it's a conservation it's like trauma trauma we are in a state of threat if we've been traumatized as a conservative reaction we've been hurt we're not going to get hurt again Chronic pain fits that same model. So the answer to a lot to that basic question is, I think that if the sympt if the disorder has core features of dysautonomia, autonomic features of dysregulation, 
I, I think there's an optimistic journey that will start being unfolded as people start understanding that they can optimize the neural regulation of their autonomic nervous systems. And they don't have to do it through surgery and they don't have to do it with pharmaceuticals. So I'd like to say a few things here. First of all, um, there's all kinds of evidence with fibromyalgia that people, it's, re, it's, it's really related to childhood trauma, which would put people into a state of fear, of course, number one. Number two, there's evidence, as far as I'm concerned, not as far as I'm concerned, with Parkinson's that is related to, uh, to stress. And, yeah. um, and um, finally, what you said about chronic pain, I mean, I'm glad that's being discovered now, but there was this American physiatrist, back specialist called John Sarno, yeah, who, yeah. Been, who talked about it decades ago about how chronic pain is actually has to do with um, yeah. your body dysregulation and it's not to do, so that you can operate on it all you want. Yeah. But he said he saved thousands of people from surgery just yeah. by making them aware of their emotional states. Yeah, this the people were actually, I would say, uh, pro, uh, uh, children of uh, Sarno in the sense they were his offspring, literally, who followed him. And the, the, the group was is basically centered or organized by a spinal surgeon who quit after 35 years because he felt he was doing damage. He was hurting people and mm. it was too much for him. And basically, and he's now functionally, I would use the term, a group psychotherapist. He runs groups and people become pain free. And so it's very much in the Sarno tradition. Wonderful. Wow. We're getting a, a lot of questions about how to. So what are some of the two, three practices you recommend to increase the vagal health or the... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm going to basically give you categories. So we're really talking about neural exercises that turn on and off the uh, newer ventral vagus. So we are able to access it and regulate our bodily state by getting more of this vagal influence to our organs. And we do this through things like breathing. Breathing is the simplest mode. Uh, deep, uh, slow exhalations as we exhale the vagal break gets really implemented and when we inhale we turn it off so if we watch people when they get anxious and excited long inhalations short exhalations so we if we extend the durations of our phrases if we sing uh, or play a wind instrument uh, those are neural exercises and if dancing is a good neural exercise because it's movement with facial interaction uh, reciprocal play is important and so we start seeing that these are really in, uh, ways of, 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 I would say, neural exercises. So I want to, in my own uh, conceptualization, I want to elevate play as a neural exercise. And I want to elevate sociality or social interaction as a neural modulator. I want it at the range, the level of a neural stimulator. And once we accept that social interaction is as potent as a neural stimulator. We'll start inviting sociality into treatment models. Isn't that interesting, Stephen, that everything you've said is um, an organic part and parcel of indigenous cultures? Yeah. yeah. The chanting, so, the dancing, the, the singing, you know. Not, nothing original. You know, my view has been is that part of our Western world is everything has to be new and original. Yeah. And part of my thrill of actually unfolding polyvagal theory is that it has continuity with yeah. the history of humanity. And mm -hmm. so you feel comfortable that it's not different than it just creates a different language. Within the world of yoga, they have really embraced polyvagal theory because there are parallels, even using different words for the same state for the same states uh, but the issue is continuity giving a language that is neuroscience based and contemporary to create a validity to provide a validity on our ancient knowledge i have to tell you sometimes i laugh about it because you know people like you and i we get a lot of attention for our work and our grades and everything but what we think what we're saying has been known by human beings for so long yeah. Yeah. I have the same response, and I actually feel that the theory just put together what, in my mind, was obvious. And yeah. in your words, and the issue is that it built on my extraction of information. It didn't build on discovery of new information. 
it built mm. on the integration of it. Mm. Wonderfully put. Thank you. Beautiful. Awesome. Maybe one final question. What is the future of polyvagal theory? What might an integrated theory of neuro and vital regulation offer? Well, I feel that uh, polyvagal theory provides literally an umbrella to start re-changing how we treat the human condition. That it, it, it should be understood in terms of how we uh, create schools or regulate or, or develop educational models. But I'm also now vested in uh, working with a group to see if we can redesign medical education. And, and doing this literally in a gentle way. The gentle way is that polyvagal theory provides organizational properties or principles, and it doesn't throw out the content that has been established, but puts it into the context of human interaction. And remember, in medicine, what's going on is that people are treated as if they're objects, and both by the, by the physicians, but also by the treatment that physicians are administering, and the individual feels marginalized from the get-go. Yeah. Well, the the speed with which we are living, like you said, we live in, con in chronic threat st state. Yeah. Like, what can we do collectively to slow down? Is there anything? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, okay, this is part, and I gotta hope that Gabor joins me on this journey, that as we get older, we become less vulnerable to the things that affected us when we were younger. So our children are grown up, they're doing well, we have sufficient financial resources, and then our, our issue of prestige becomes less important because you know, people have treated both of us very nicely. When we get to that stage, we get a degree of being patient and we realize that when people understand and start to understand what their vulnerabilities are. Let's say you take the vulnerability of financial security away. What is life? And so much of life in the world that has been structured is linked to financial uh, security or appearance of financial security. And what we need to understand is that underneath the what I call wrappers around our core, we have to have a great respect that our human core, our essence, is really quite benevolent. It's quite accessible and welcoming to others. It's the wrappers that give us the problem in our society, the protections that we put around ourselves to survive because we're under chronic threat. So we need to be respectful of that core. And if we are respectful enough of that core, we're not going to have the same uh, opportunities for our lives to be taken over by fear and threat. And so we can start working on, let's say, generations, our children, their children, our grandchildren. What can we do to enable them to have sufficient security to be bold enough to move outward? Now, see, with Gabor, Gabor had the resources to be bold. And this is the part that I am really very interested in because I've been reflecting on my own trajectory and saying, where? Did that boldness come from? Where was the security that said, go out there and break the paradigm? Because we all, and I say we, I mean, the war people like us want to be accepted. We want, to, we want the mutuality of connected with, with our peers. And we know that when we have this passion to do things, we know that we are actually creating a risk of our relationships with those who are our peers. And this is an interesting journey but it's a journey based on a pure and deep conviction and passion that in a sense I'm, I'm going to say this kind of often we've seen a light we've seen an understanding of what it is to be a human being and we will not stop until we see it in a sense actualized in more people mm -hmm. mm -hmm. no. anything to comment on that or well, two things came up me very briefly one is uh, Stephen talk about as we get older well there used to be this institution called eldership yeah. and uh, Stephen Jenkinson talked very eloquently about that that in our society we have elders but we know we, we have we have the elderly but we no longer have elders 
Yeah. And, and there's wisdom in eldership. And then we just don't recognize it. We don't honor it. We don't listen to it. Yeah. Uh, you and I may be getting older, but we're listening, but we listen to for our expertise. Um, but elders, even without expertise, have a lot of wisdom. And probably yeah. understood. Number one. Uh, number two, uh, there's a deep choice that people have to make. And unfortunately, a lot of children, because of childhood experiences, aren't able to make it, which is between being authentic or being attached. Now, ideally, we can be both authentic and attached. In other words, we can be ourselves and still be in a relationship. But yeah. what happens when, if we ourselves, our relationships will reject us? The child is in no position to choose authenticity because they can't live without attachment. So mm -hmm. very early in life, most people make this tragic unconscious choice. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this in my new book. Okay, I'm going to do whatever I can to fit in and therefore surrender my authenticity. And I think much of life's journey afterwards is actually rediscovering our authenticity. And, 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 and as an adult, I no longer have to give up myself to be in relationship. And if I have to give up myself to be in relationship, I'd rather not be in relationship. That's yeah. really difficult for a lot of people. Well, Gabor, you're actually, uh, there's a part of that that is, you know, very intriguing because part of the relationship is our relationship with the past and with our family, with our parents. Yeah. Yeah. And those of us or many of us who have been bold were actually deviants within our own family. Yeah. And this, this was very painful and difficult. But as we get older, we start, for me, I see my parents in a totally different light. I see them as, as heroic trying to deal with what they had. Yeah. And also seeing them trying to deal with this complicated kid that was literally dropped in their laps. And yeah. and, and they did did well. The the issue is that they weren't me. I think that's part of what we start learning is that our kids, we have a responsibility to our children, but we are not our children and our children are not us. And we do what we can do. And as long as we do it with a degree of humility and gratitude, I think things work out really well. And it's that latter word, gratitude, which is in my life, a new word coming into my experiences that uh, when you wake up in the morning and you read the emails, and I'm sure you have some of these as well, that your heart uh, both opens up and you feel that you, what a wonderful opportunity you've had to impact on a positive level to humanity, that you're not a, uh, in a sense, you're not a, a blade of grass that has just been stepped on. You you are actually out there sending out seeds and spores all over the place with good ideas and courage. And that's how I, I feel. It's a remarkable time in one's life to feel that way. And I think you should feel, you, you I assume you feel the same way. I should say you oh, should. Oh, oh, but I, oh, oh, but I do. Uh, oh, but I do. And, and. Finally, one more thing I can be absolutely grateful for is because I pursue this path and I do this work, I get to meet such wonderful people, you know, and like yourself, like these two who are conducting this workshop. It's um, it's really rewarding when you can start expressing yourself and, and, and making it. Oh. oh, yeah. To say things without being for me. I, remember, I come from a very structured academic tradition yeah. or history. And yeah. the world that I come from doesn't, in a sense, sanction even what I'm doing with you today. It's just mm -hmm. not what what uh, laboratory scientists do. They don't, in a sense, create and express and infer. They restrict. They basically express the fear of peer uh, ostracizing. Mm. Wow. Well, all the all the more thanks to you then, because. <laughs> Because I don't have to worry about that. I'm, I don't. I, you know, one of the things I've been grateful for is that I was spared having to exist in an academic background. You know. Well, well it's an interesting journey. That's all I can say. And yeah. and I can smile back at it, and I can see all the flaws in it. But I also can see uh, the benefits that you know credibility within that world has been useful, and yeah. it has also enabled me to walk into your world with a degree of credibility. So I'm not totally negative, and now I'm crossing back in. I'm trying to restructure, you know, how educational programs are set up. In, in well, one was I, there are actually three areas we're working on. One is medicine, mm -hmm. uh, one is education, mm -hmm. and the other one is business organizations. 
<laughs> so in a sense, uh, we're actually, we created an institute called Polydata Institute to bore is on the board. And part of the agenda is to develop educational materials and to certify different educational programs and institutions as being polyvagal informed, meaning that they adhere to the principles of the theory, which in a way is we're really saying, treat people like they're human beings. That's what we're saying. Wow. Well, thank you, Stephen, for sharing not just your brilliant intellect and mind, but also your beautiful heart. We could and letting yeah. us really feel you. Thank you. Thank and you. Gabor, your brilliant interview is just uh, these. Yeah. yeah, such a liveness in this conversation. Such yeah. a engage. It's so engaging and so yeah. alive. Exactly. It's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for letting us in to your brilliance and. Done. Well, let's put brilliance aside and say our passionate uh, commitment, I think, is far greater than our yeah. brilliance. That this we, right. have this, we have this passion, and the passion yeah. is really what comes from our insides. Speak, mm -hmm. speak for yourself. My brilliance is... <laughs> <laughs> Gabor's brilliance is passionate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, but but yeah. what shines through us is the heart. I mean, there is the, the passion, passion cannot come just from here. Yeah. Passion exactly. is something that has to be embodied, yeah, embodied, and both of you, in similar and completely different ways at the same time, embodied that. And that's such so refreshing yeah. to talk yeah. about such important topic and feel that they come, you know, with the ah, yummy. Yeah. That's but I, I think for me, and I'm sure for Gabor, there's so many rewards we've got. We've been helpful to people. And that helpfulness to other has certainly been uh, the rewards that we wanted, that we were on the right track. And I think that is really, that's the resource, is the people responding to us. Yeah. 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 Well, thank wow. you both. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Take care. Yeah. Welcome everybody to the Banyan Books podcast. My name is Ross McKeechee and today we are excited to be in conversation with Dr. Stephen Porges. Now before I get to his formal introduction, I'll make our usual Banyan announcements. First off, acknowledging that although we have people joining from everywhere in the world, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound in Vancouver is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Banyan Books is in its 50th anniversary year this year, 50 years as a local independent bookstore, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Everybody, please support your local independent bookstores. Every time you make a purchase from Banyan Books, it helps to support these kinds of wonderful programs like we're having with you today. Our website is banyan.com. That's B-A-N-Y-E-N.com. Now our honored guest today 
Dr. Stephen W. Porges. He, in 1994, proposed the polyvagal theory. In 2011, after decades of research, he published his first book on the subject. The polyvagal theory took the therapeutic world by storm, bringing Dr. Porges' insights about the autonomic nervous system to a clinical audience interested in understanding trauma, anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. A little bit of context and background regarding our guest. Dr. Porges is Distinguished University Scientist at Indiana University, where he is the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium in the Kinsey Institute. He is Professor of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina and Professor Emeritus at both the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Maryland. He served as president of the Society for Psychophysiological Research and the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and is a former recipient of a National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Development Award. He has published more than 350 peer-reviewed scientific papers across several disciplines, including biomedical engineering, critical care medicine, exercise physiology, neuroscience, pediatrics, psychiatry, psychology, and substance abuse. He is the world's leading expert on the relationship between the autonomic nervous system, a neural system that oversees largely unconscious functions, such as heart rate and digestion, and social behavior. He holds several patents involved in monitoring and regulating autonomic state with applications in mental and physical health. He's also the creator of a music-based intervention, the Safe and Sound Protocol, which currently is used by more than 2,000 therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, to reduce hearing sensitivities, and to improve language processing and state regulation. Dr. Porges is the author of a number of books, including The Polyvagal Theory, The Pocket Guide to Polyvagal Theory, and is co-editor of Clinical Applications of the Polyvagal Theory. Today, he is here in conversation with Banyan Books about his brand new book, Polyvagal Safety, Attachment, Communication, Self-Regulation. Dr. Gabor Mate says of this book, it is nuanced, richly detailed, and written with clarity. Polyvagal safety is a matchless gift to physicians and therapists and to all students of the body's inextricable unity with the psyche. So Banyan Books community, please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Stephen Porges. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ross and Nick, for the uh, very flattering and uh, introduction. I'm sitting here listening to it and saying, what is this guy going to be talking about? <laughs> but thank you for welcoming me on your podcast. So nice to have you here. And, and what a wonderful uh, book that you've put out. I'm curious, uh, what was your central aim in building on Hollywood? Okay, when I developed polyvagal theory, we go back into the 1990s, and just like, I was going to say, just like Banyan books, I've been around since the, I was an assistant professor in 1970, so there are parallel uh, trajectories of maturation. Uh, but what you can see, and even in the sense of reading my bio, uh, longevity helps, persistence helps and uh, embedded in that there is some quality so in a sense being around and being reasonably good enables you to have uh, let's say portals of influence and where ideas can be translated but there's a there's an interesting narrative uh, backstory and that is to be able to leverage uh, academic or scientific credentials and ideas and move it into the clinical world requires that you have to be accepted within your academic discipline. So, you know, there are a lot of what we would call in, in the world, when I put on my hat as the aggressive academic, a lot of failed academicians out there writing books and telling people what to do. 
but I actually uh, serve an interesting or have, let's say, served an interesting role, and that was to maintain the academic credibility, the science credibility, and then to translate it and bridge it into the clinical world. So I was not a clinician, but I would say that the greatest compliment that I've ever been paid is that he has a heart like a like a like a clinician. So uh, he's a researcher, but with a heart like a clinician. And I think that is the real word here, and that comes makes me feel good because it's all about translation of ideas into practice and make the world better. And that's been the journey. Now, to get really at your question, where did this all kind of come from? Um, the over the years, when I started, in a sense, articulating polyvagal theory, it was really about that we had different physiological circuits, different autonomic states that promoted different types of behaviors. So like if we're in one physiological state, we can be uh, social, we can be spontaneously engaging, we can be in close proximity with another. When we shift into another physiological state, the world's our enemy and we're reactive to everyone. No one, no one can come close. And then if we experience life threat, which many survivors of trauma have, then their presence in the world is literally to shut down, disappear and dissociate. So I developed this, this theory based upon uh, the existing literature on the evolution of the autonomic nervous system. So there's evolution, there's comparative uh, neuroanatomy, and when you start putting that together with developmental uh, physiology and developmental uh, behaviors and with clinical pathology, suddenly the world just springs out at you. And the first rule is that our autonomic nervous system goes into different states, just like ice, water, or steam. It's different properties when it's in these different states. The other part of it is that those states or the repertoire of our states are basically a gift of evolution and that we uh, evolved with ancient vertebrates when they were under threat, they shut down. And then as vertebrates evolved to spinal, sp uh, bony fish, you start getting a sympathetic nervous system, a spinal sympathetic nervous system. And then uh, this remains the two major systems that are there for reptiles. Reptiles shut down or they're aggressive. But mammals come into the world with something different. Mammals actually, I, I like to use this term, there's this uh, evolutionary uh, uh, birthright. And that was that enabled them through their interactions with one another to turn off their threat reactions. So our sociality became the bridge that enabled us to mitigate threat reactions. And that became uh, proximity and bonding. It became relationship building, parenting. Uh, we have all kinds of terms we can use, but the basic word is trust. And the act of trusting a person enables that sociality, that interaction, that co-regulation to be elevated to a role of neural modulation. So this is, in a sense, almost oblique to many, how many people would talk. But what I'm saying is that our social behavior has the capacity to turn off threat reactions. Now, after I said that, you can hear it. You say, oh, what's so, what's so special about that? They have, you know, we have babies, we calm them down. We have dogs, we calm them down. Uh, but how do we calm them down? We are sending them cues of safety that the nervous system has no choice but to accept intonation of voice, the gestures. Polyvagal theory deconstructs what we already, already knew. So there's nothing new in polyvagal theory, except we now give it a language that's consistent with our evolution and with our science. Fantastic. Now, speaking of languaging, after you came out with polyvagal theory, the, the ways that it could be used are so broad. And you, you came up with uh, four new constructs that you felt were important to communicate these relevant theories yeah. to therapists. Can you tell us about those four constructs? Well, you might have to remind me, but sure. <laughs> because, no, the reason is that it could be, uh, I think we're going to go, well, why don't you ask each one and I'll tell you. Sure. Well, well, starting with vagal break. Yeah, so it, in a sense, this idea, let's visualize we have this nervous system that evolved, 
that can turn off threat reactions. It does that through a new innovation of it, the vehicle system, part of the parasympathetic component of the autonomic nervous system, through functionally a braking mechanism. It's a cardio inhibitory, meaning it slows the heart rate. So when people get anxious and mobilized, often they feel their heart pounding, their heart's racing, and in their mind they have to move. And often they develop narratives about why they have to move. And now we have people in fights or arguments and with passion because they're physiologically mobilized. But what this says is that if I can recruit that vagal, that vagal system, it works like a brake. It works reflexively and immediate, immediately. It will just calm me down. And this, you can see this with babies who are in tantrum and if a mother is using a prosodic voice, gesture, the baby calms down. If the father comes in and yells at the baby, the baby's not going to calm down. Uh, we, there are things that are so obvious. Then you can say, well, what about fathers? And they, what, what do they do with their puppies? They are really great. And they're, you know, so in a sense, we have our social roles as parents. As fathers, we often think we have to create boundaries and discipline, and the mother can do the soft stuff. But with our dog, we'll do everything. So we'll, we'll use a, a pet ease voice. We'll talk like we're talking to a baby. But the dog's nervous system detects those intonations, just like a baby does. And remember, it's the intonation of the voice not the words. This is all pre-verbal and dogs don't understand that many words. Right. So tone of voice is so key for communicating trust. Yeah. And we'll get into that. Uh, I actually, I'm going to help you along on this through the other construct, which is neuroception. And neuroception is this uh, system wired into our body that detects either risk or cues of safety. Now, the detection of risk has been well known, and that's been basically emphasized in all, let's say, psychological, psychobiological research as, you know, threat reactions. We all know that. So virtually every living organism has a defense system, no question. But in that evolutionary transition from asocial reptiles to social mammals, mammals got another tool, not just a tool for defense, but a tool that turned off their defenses, calmed them down, made them feel safe. And that became, the, in a sense, the tipping point in the vertebrate evolution that enabled sociality. And to quote uh, another person from Vancouver, Gabor, who you mentioned earlier, he talks about this in terms of humanity. And I talk about it in terms of sociality, but we're talking about the same thing. The core of being a human is this ability to co-regulate and to send cues back and forth. And these cues are detected outside of awareness. So they're not perception. They're really rapid. If they were perception, we detect it, we evaluate it, and we make a decision. Neuroception works through brain structures, but it avoids becoming conscious because if it were conscious, it would be too slow. We would not be around. And because of that, it makes some mistakes and sometimes it does things that we're really not comfortable with. So we are often, we use terms like, I have this gut feeling about this person. And you might ask, say, well, tell me what you, why do you have that feeling? And did you, did you agree with what the person was saying? Oh yeah. But there's something about that person that makes me feel uncomfortable and I don't trust them or her. And it has a lot to do with these projections of vocalizations and, and motor gestures, because we are literally broadcasting our physiological state in our voice and on our face. And that is also part of polyvagal theory because the nerves that control vocal intonation are vagal nerves that parallel the cardio-inhibitory ones on our heart. And functionally, it was that vocalization uh, adaptation that mammals had 
that create this bridge to sociality. They could broadcast their physiological state to another one of their species, and they can get closer. You're not going to be eaten. They're going to be dead. But remember, we detect that in people's voices today, and what do we tell ourselves? Forget that. Listen to the words. Now the other the other uh, construct was social engagement system. The social yeah. engagement. this this was I had already as I come out with the theory, and then I started to in a sense elaborate in terms of how does this theory work in the real world? How does it work? So I had to come up with this concept of how do you trigger these different physiological states? If I detect safety, I trigger the calm state. If I detect uh, eminent danger, I trigger the sympathetic system so I can mobilize, fight, and flee. And if I have uh, overwhelming odds that I'm going to die, I disappear, I dissociate, I shut down. And you can start seeing the adaption, the adaptive function of each of those, and you can see it even in other mammals. So you, you, you have that model. So that became the neuroception. Then I wanted to figure out what was this whole circuit that had the face and the voice like I was bringing up. And how did that circuit interact with those cardio inhibitory vagal fibers? It can seem like it's a little obtuse, but it's all part of the same system that our voice and our heart and our face and our heart are how we negotiate social distance, uh, proximity, and functionally uh, being able to touch each other with our bodies going into uh, a defensive mode. So when I started to study the neuroanatomy really carefully, I started to find this interesting, let's call it a backstory. So if we can think of vagal uh, neurons as actors in this story. The vagal neurons uh, at that transition from reptiles to mammals go for a hike. They start going on a journey and they actually move from the back of the brainstem, a dorsal area of the brainstem, that even in mammals regulates our gut and the lower diaphragm, and they start traveling ventrally, and then they meet up in the area of the brainstem that regulates the muscles of the face and head, and that creates this new ventral vagal complex, but it also has the, uh, uh, the neurons that regulate all the striated muscles of the face and head. So our expressivity, our adjusted behavior, even the muscles that regulate our middle ear, which enables us to hear human voice in background noise. It's all part of the same system. So when people are safe, they can hear what people are saying. When they are mobilized or scared, they can hear background sounds, predator sounds, but the frequency band of human voice gets buried. They can't hear it. Now, Within psychology, people say, well, the priorities change. Within poly polyvagal theory, it says, don't go so deep, it's simple. The transfer function of these physical mechanisms that allow sounds to get into the inner ear change when you are under a state of threat versus when you're safe. So this goes into, you, you mentioned you had an interest in autism. Yeah. Autistic kids have been, in a sense, inappropriately chastised for not listening to human voice. And they were uh, they were auditorily sensitive, but they couldn't understand or hear human voice. And everyone went ballistic. You're not hearing because you don't want to. Therefore, we need to use uh, conditioning procedures. But the function of what they were sensitive to were primarily low frequency sounds, which are predator sounds, ventilation sounds, air conditioners, traffic noise, ventilation systems, elevators, you know it, because if you talk to families with autistic kids, you'll get the array, but they can't extract the human voice because the frequency then of human voice was being masked by the low frequency sounds. Polyvagal theory explained that and then says, what happens if we can now rehabilitate that system? Right. And then, then what happens? So let's so we have vagal break, we have neuroception. Now, 
I mean, basically, the secret of that social engagement system is where did those cardio inhibitory vagal fibers go? They went to a brainstem area, a column that regulated all the striated muscles that evolved from the ancient gill arches. So now we have a neural system that is controlling musculature that creates vocalizations, listening, and expression, facial expression. And it's not merely correlated with, it's integrated with the cardio inhibitory, meaning it's slowing up the heart when you're calm and it's pulling that break off if there's threat. And when there's threat, what happens to people's faces? They go flat. What happens to their voices? They get higher pitch, less prosody, less melodic features, less vagal vocal tone. Wow. Okay, so we've covered vagal break, the social engagement system, neuroception, and, and you've covered a fair bit, maybe you can touch on it again, the, the frequency band of perceptual advantage is the four. Yeah, that was um, actually an interesting kind of dis discovery as I was, let's say, piloting around. The point is that when we look at the frequencies that humans ex use to extract uh, cues of social communication, they're well, very well defined. And we can find that all mammals, based on the physics of those middle ear structures, have a, a sweet spot. So they have a frequency band for many of the mammals. We'll, they call them ultrasounds, but they're audible to these small mammals. The point is, based on the physics, we know where to look to find where the social communication is going because to to process that frequency band of perceptual advantage where it's easy for me to hear your voice i am functionally giving up my hypervigilance for predator sounds because predator sounds are low frequency sounds and the actual process to get there is not i have to think it is that the muscles regulating the middle ear structures have to now tense up and they tighten the eardrum and what that means is the low frequency sounds rather than permeating the middle ear and going into the inner ear bounce off so when we start talking about autistic kids or kids with auditory hypersensitivities they tend to have language delays or language problems because they're not getting the information in that perceptual band of that perceptual frequency band of, of advantage Okay, thank you. Now, in chapter four of polyvagal safety, I was very interested. Uh, chapter four is titled Vagal Pathways as Portals to Compassion. I was really interested. Can you illuminate what polyvagal theory tells us about compassion? Well, I think it, it, it goes to really the, I think we want to lead to discussion where did the title come from, polyvagal safety. And what Polyvagal theory teaches us that turning off of threat reactions, which means our bodies in a state of safety, is where everything come, where everything that makes us human comes from. So whether we want to talk about spirituality or compassion, we're not going to be a spiritual species or, or a compassionate species if we're under constant threat. And polyvagal theory says it's not just taking away threat. That's okay. That's good. That's not sufficient. You take away threat, but you need to have cues of safety. So what we start learning is that if we go through, let's say, traditions of uh, contemplative sciences, and there's certain environments and certain practices, you find out that those practices are usually vagal exercises, like chanting or posture shifts or breathing. They're vagal, they're neural exercises of that ventral safety vagal circuit. And they're often done, and I even describe in that chapter, uh, cathedrals. What happens in the cathedral where they all have these enormous organs that are playing very low frequencies? And those frequencies under the normal situation would be terrifying because they are the frequencies of predators. But within a safe environment, it now gives you a spiritual feeling of awe. So because you're in these cathedrals, which are really fortresses. So there's a lot of 
of interaction between the stimulation, uh, the physical characteristics of places, and the personal experiences one has. So in that chapter, I kind of uh, basically say that uh, we need to be safe to be compassionate. And we need to be, uh, and that includes a self-compassion, that if we're in a world that is under constant threat, and we are constantly blaming ourselves, creating the threat unto ourselves, then uh, our chances of being compassionate and being a good witness to another are greatly reduced. Right. I was, it was really interesting to see you made a very clear distinction between compassion and empathy. Yeah. Can you talk got, about it got me into trouble because many of my close friends had functionally branded empathy as a type of therapy they were giving or using. And I was saying, really, when you deal in the world of trauma and mental health disorders, you don't want to be empathic. You want to be compassionate. And if you go into, in a sense, the science of empathy versus how it's used within the clinical world may not be the same thing. So I started to talk in this mode as the scientist. The scientist says empathy is really where our body mimics the pain of others. And then from my own knowledge of, of interacting with many people who have lived through severe traumas, they don't want their story, their narrative to hurt others. So they don't even want to tell about themselves because people will cringe and say, oh, we have to get back at these people or, you know, you have to have justice or righteousness. Uh, that's not what they want, at least initially. They want to be heard. They want their voice. They want to be witnessed. So I started to say that my friends who were calling their therapies uh, empathy based, I said, you really, I watch you do your work. It's not empathy, it's compassion because you're able to uh, respect and honor the other person's feelings without letting the other person's feelings overwhelm you. And that's what an empathic experience would be. Right, okay, thank you. Now, uh, I was also particularly interested in chapter five, which is on yoga therapy and polybagal theory. Of course, I'm a practitioner of yoga, student of yoga. Can you tell us a bit about the, how, this is an ancient science. What is what does polyvagal theory bring uh, and help illuminate in parallel to the yogic science? Well, I think what uh, polyvagal theory does it provides a parallel mapping of what was already embedded in yoga, in a sense, the understanding of underlying states, uh, how we react. Uh, it is since the the. The chapter, which is primarily driven by Mara Elisa Sullivan, uh, is really focuses on, on what do trauma, I'd say trauma yoga therapists and yoga practitioners, what are they doing? It's really saying that the core uh, of yoga is not solely a belief system. It's literally a science system under a different name. And what polyvagal theory gives to yoga is a translation. It says what you are doing can be translated into contemporary neuroscience. And I think that helps people, it helps them feel validated. And the issue, remember, part of the world of yoga and part of the world of mental health is the uh, dismissiveness of medicine about mental health, traditionally of saying, oh, it's just in your head. Polyvagal theory and yoga say that it's not just in your head, it's in your body. It's an integrated neural reaction. And that's why many people who have certain dis types of disorders will gravitate to yoga because it makes them feel better, but they don't have the language to basically say a yoga is a neural exercise that leads to a better uh, embodiment or let's say in a science level, a more enhanced brain visceral organ regulation. So what you're doing with yogic exercises is you're doing neural exercises of your basically viscera and your skeletal motor systems. Right. And you, you bring together the, the philosophy of yoga that talks about the three gunas, the three qualities of material nature with these neural platforms, the yeah. ventral vagal, 
sympathetic nervous system and dorsal vagal complex. Can you tell us how those parallel? Um, well, what, what I would not, not really, <laughs> but, but the, the parallel is quite, I would say it's just different names for the same things. And so if, uh, if one set of language or set of terms is defining a structure that leads to certain types of functions, that's what yoga is doing as well. It's saying, this is what emerges from these states. And polyvagal theory just uses a different language. Um, so I don't think it's anything different. What I'm really trying to say is that there's, okay, so if, it do, if it's doing the same thing, why is it necessary? So the answer for that is that without a, a system like polyvagal theory, yoga remains yoga. It doesn't translate into contemporary neurophysiology, doesn't translate into the mechanisms of uh, optimistic or let's say optimal health or illness. And I think what polyvagal theory does is it gives it a translation. That So I don't see anything, you know, it's everything is important. I don't mean to minimize the contribution of polyvagal theory. But I see it that uh, yoga is a complete integrated system on multiple levels, including, we could say, a philosophy of life. But it conveys its actual building blocks can be translated into the constructs that are neuroanatomically and neurophysiologically described in polyvagal theory. And, and so I see it, it, it's helpful to yoga. I don't think it is yoga. I understand. Okay, thank you. I'm really uh, building on that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you call these neural exercises and the five yeah. global states and how these neural platforms interact? Yeah, so we basically have three um, circuits, we would call that a circuit of uh, with that ventral vagal circuit, this newer mammalian one, which has this capacity to downregulate threat. We have a sympathetic fight flight system, uh, which, cre well, a sympathetic nervous system that can be uh, co opted to fight flight behaviors. And we have this dorsal vagus, this older vagal circuit, which uh, you can see it in, in snakes or other reptiles when they immobilize. And the reptiles can immobilize for long periods of time and even not breathe for a couple hours because the brains are small. But mammals have big brains, and so they can't really go into that dorsal vagal one for long periods of time. And if they go there, they better adapt that reaction in future cases, not to totally shut down, pass out, uh, because they wouldn't have enough oxygen to their brain. So we have those three, and they're kind of let's view them as pure states. So. And this actually uh, overlaps with the yoga as well. You have pure states, they have these other hybrid states. So you have the social engagement system with the ventral vagus and we're smiling and we're happy. We have the sympathetics being recruited for defense and we're aggressive and fighting with each other. And we have the dorsal vagus, which when it's doing its job, uh, we have good digestion and all the organs below the diaphragm are fine, but under threat, we get it in the gut. And in the world we live in, many people have irritable bowel and literally gut problems because they're basically absorbing or living through chronic threat. Okay, so we now have those basic ones, but we also have hybrids. So if we take the social engagement system and mobilize, we call that dance or play. And now we, we are in looking at each other so that our movements do not elicit uh, threat reactions. That's why we look at each other. You can watch animals play, and there, if they, if an animal is not making face-to-face -face contact, they're no longer playing. And if we watch kids on the playground, it's the same thing. And again, going to your interest in autism, children with autism are often in a physiological state of defensive immobilization, and they're not sending cues of safety to those that they may want to play with. So they're not always welcomed into groups because if they're not making eye contact, someone's going to get hurt. 
So when a play is a dance, when kids play with each other, they're aware of each other's presence, and that's a neural exercise. So dance and movement is this uh, utilizing mobilization, sympathetic activity, but also keeping it contained through social engagement. Similarly, we can literally immobilize without going into a state of life threat if someone is next to us talking sweet nothings into our ear. You know, so we're in a sense being reassured by the vocal activity of the social media system that our bodies are safe to be close to each other. This is a you know mother and a baby or two peers, you know, this is this is this is how proximity where you no longer need to look at the person's face to hear the voice and you interpret their presence. And this becomes, as I shared, moments of intimacy. We do not need to be sexual. There are moments of where bodies feel safe with each other. And then you have, uh, if you take away that social engagement system, that system of immobilization becomes really fear-based and shutting down. And of course, people with trauma histories will talk about wanting to be embraced, but when they are embraced, their bodies get reactive because the system has a memory of injury. Now, what happens, remember I was saying about shutting down, you don't want to do that too often because you need oxygen. Well, there's an adaptation where you now utilize a sufficient amount of sympathetic tone so that when you immobilize, you're freezing, you're not passing out. And, or you're dissociating, you're not passing out. So the body has these various strategies which the nervous system does to keep us alive. So freezing and dissociation are really advanced innovations of a nervous system to say you're under threat, but if you shut down, it may be lethal. So it's making those decisions for you. So that gives you, uh, let's say five, five uh, functional states coming out of those three circuits. There probably could be other hybrids in different ways. I'll, you know, but I started off just describing the three and then I realized it didn't cover everything and I start modifying it over time. Right. Can we talk a little bit about trauma and trauma therapy? I mean, we're living in such a traumatized world. Yeah. Um, first of all, it, it, the, the way you say it, it, it almost assumes that there was a time when we didn't. Right. So, <laughs> and, and, and so like even in, in, in titling the book Polyvagal Safety, there is a visualization that somewhere in our a collective unconsciousness, if I can use that term, um, there is a notion of what it would be like if we lived in a world that was safe. And I like to always talk about the core of humanity, the core of people. This is like Gabor's humanity, but the core of being human to me is to be generous, compassionate, uh, to be accessible. And I think the core of people tends to be really admirable, but we have wrappers to protect us. Let's visualize these wrappers. And those wrappers are, could be called defense mechanisms. Uh, and our society says you live under threat all the time. And if you are not under threat, we're going to tell you that you are under threat. Think of the educational process. And think of the medical system. You go into physicians for assessments, not for is that shared journeys of wellness. You're going in there to get the test and you basically hope the tests are okay. Everything is about measurement and that measurement is an assessment. And when our nervous system detects that we're being evaluated, we're already under threat. What's the educational model? Assessment, assessment, assessment. What's the work model? Productivity all the time. Now, our nervous system is really quite agile. We can deal with this uh, really well for short periods of time. What we need are some periods of time where we are no longer, let's say, hypervigilant or under states of defense. We need select relationships where we can just feel that we are ourselves. We don't need to have any around us. Unfortunately, what happens with society is we just, society pushes us more and more into a toxic, we use words like toxic stress or chronic threat. 
I basically say, let's get rid of those words and let's do something very simple. We're disrupting, we're under threat and we're disrupting our body's ability to support health growth and restoration. It's as simple as that. Our body's homeostatic functions are disrupted by the ambience of the world that we're in. So we're not optimizing our experience, our creativity, our love, our trust, our, our social, social abilities to help each other. We're doing absolutely the opposite. Right. Thank you. Now, before we get to our audience questions, I just, the, the, the closing chapter of, of polyvagal safety touch on coronavirus and, and, and uh, the, poly, the polyvagal theory outlook and how that's impacting our nervous systems. Can you, can you go into that? Yeah, I wrote that paper at the bequest of a, uh, a journal editor who was a psychiatry journal. And he wanted a uh, editorial about what, what I thought was going on. And I basically viewed it as a paradox between avoiding threat and being exposed to more threats. So the virus itself is threatening. It's real. So the history of humanity is that we avoid threats. But how do we mitigate threat? We mitigate it through social interactions or with a polyvagal terminology through co-regulation with another. So we're sending each other cues back and forth of our social engagement system. That's turning on our ventral vagal circuit. And we go back to a more homeostatic physiological state of calmness and relaxation and trust. But what happened? How, what was the public health message and what it is still? And that is be careful, distance yourself from other people. So in most people's uh, social world, uh, we, before the pandemic, uh, we didn't just interact with our spouse or family, we interacted with a variety of friends. And we had select friends that we would be with to deal with you know, different types of, uh, let's say, challenges in our life. Um, uh, what happened during the pandemic is other people became a source of threat. And so you end up retuning your autonomic nervous system. And I want to bring this whole notion up of retuned autonomic nervous system and actually bring it back to the very beginning. Polyvagal theory brings to the clinical uh, arena the emphasis that our physiological state is an important intervening variable between the world outside the body and the reactions of the body. So if you are a therapist or you're a teacher, uh, whatever you're doing, the, do your, your client or your, uh, even your spouse, their reactions are not cognitive reactions based upon the validity of what you're saying. It's based upon the physiological state they're in. So we have to be very aware that as our physiology retunes to a more threatened state, we become very biased towards negativity. And so we blame others and we get angry. We become reactive much easier. Now, during the pandemic, we have really uh, unusual situations, especially working from home and having kids at home. I have no idea how professional families can function or have functioned. I have no idea how it would be for a teenager not to be able to be uh, co-regulate with friends and being literally in a room with their family. So it, the, there's almost this model, you're home with your family and that's all good. But we already know that uh, there's a significant number of family environments that are toxic. There are toxic marriages, there are toxic uh, parenting. And so the long-term outcome of this is going to be, it's going to take time. We've been doing research during the pandemic on individuals who got the, the virus and those who did not. And this is where we start redefining pre-existing conditions. So we did a, a study with over 1,500 people who did not get the virus uh, and looked at their mental health symptom, symptoms. And we measured their adversity history, meaning their trauma history. And we measured their subjective autonomic reactivity. How could they, how were they describing their body? Now, based upon the, the study, we found that adversity history was 
uh, linearly related to mental health, to, I should say, linearly related to autonomic reactivity. And autonomic reactivity was the major determinant of mental health outcome. So it, there was very little unique variance or predictive value of adversity history have other than that it changed or retuned the autonomic nervous system, meaning that it made the autonomic nervous system more threat, uh, more threat reactive. Then we had a hundred individuals who had COVID. And I thought all those individual differences relating uh, adversity to autonomic reactivity would drop out with COVID because COVID is such a powerful autonomic disruptor itself, but it didn't. It amplified the effect of adversity history and elevated it. It amplified it, it made the slope. So uh, adversity history was more of a predictor of mental health outcome, even if you had COVID. And so it really uh, it changes the world because we heard a lot of statements about pre-existing conditions. And that was about survival. Uh, and that was that, I that if you had pre-existing conditions, then you're more likely to get COVID, you're more likely to have a poor outcome. And what I am saying is we don't know about health outcomes, we know about mental health outcomes. And that first history is an extraordinarily powerful predictor of how an individual will react. So if you take the adversity history and you see if it changed the autonomic nervous system, which it tends to do, it's that group that had the retuned autonomic nervous system that has the poor outcomes. And that's a testing, that's the test of the polyvagal theory that says if your intervening variable and your physiological reactivity has changed, then the outcomes are going to be uh, poor. Great. Okay, thank you. Now we've got a lot of great questions from our, our live audience here. Um, the first one, it, it relates to, to COVID. It's from Shauna and she asks, can co-regulation happen effectively over telephone or video calls? Asking from the perspective of offering counseling hmm. through these modalities as opposed to in person. It, that's an excellent question. And it, it, my response is what I've been hearing from the, from the therapeutic clinical world. And that is, they seem to think it's working extraordinarily well. And they think it's working really well with those with uh, severe trauma. And part of the reason is that uh, the client can deal with it from their own home. They're in a safer environment and they have agency. They can turn off the camera or they could ask the uh, uh, therapists to turn off the camera, they have in a sense more control in the therapeutic setting. And the feedback from therapists is also that it initially they thought was really challenging, but many of them liked it very much. So the answer is really, it seems to work well. And the point, I think the question is really about even on personal co-regulation. So for me, what I try to describe is what did the pandemic do to me? It's retuned me. I don't like going out. I don't want to go on an airplane. I don't want to go to an airport. And it's not a fear of getting the virus. It's a trepidation about being around people. And this was not who I was before. I love to be around people. So I found that very interesting. So for me, my co-regulation often occurs just as we're talking to each other wrong. So this this is my social event for the day. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. There, there's a question from Leah who asks, I am an alternative health professional, a massage therapist, with a decent knowledge of neuroanatomy. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve, correct or right, she says. And then she asks, what makes the vagus nerve important in quote unquote trauma memory within the muscles and joints? Well, let's basically uh, reframe our understanding of cranial nerves. Cranial nerves are nerves that come off uh, the brain stem. And the, the vagus is the 10th of 12 cranial nerves. 
But the cranial nerves, the way people learn them, is they start making the assumption that they're a unitary nerve. The exit from the brainstem is that of a conduit. So the vagus is actually coming off the brainstem from two different areas, that dorsal area and the ventral area, plus oodles of sensory information. So 80% of that vagus is sensory, 6% or so, or 3% are myelinated ventral vagal fibers, and that means it must be about 17% there, dorsal vagal fibers going down, and I said about 80% coming up. The point is that it's a collection of fibers doing different jobs, different pathways. The issue of what her question relates to is when the nervous system calms down, and as she was a massage therapist, correct? Yes. When the, when the nervous system calms down, the muscles relax. So that if you're in a high state of sympathetic tonicity, there's going to be high muscle tension. And the body, when it relaxes, the feedback from the body is uh, regulating. It's that, that relaxation has a major vagal component. And when the relaxation is there, then the body can deal with things that it can't deal with in the state of tension. In the state of tension, everything is biased towards threat and defense. So when the body's relaxing, it can accommodate both neuromuscularly, but also in dealing with the memories that are coming up through the therapy. Right. Okay. Thank you. There's a number of yoga related questions. I think the Banyan community has a particular interest in right? like mind body therapies. This one is from Tara. And just so you know, Tara, uh, Dr. Porges does touch on this in the book. Um, she says, Yoga is a South Asian contribution to moral philosophy. Have you done any research in yoga and polyvagal theory that doesn't have anything to do with specific practices? And instead is more to do with basic norm the basic normative ethical contribution of yoga, where right choice is prioritized in decision making over good outcome. She's interested in the effect this kind of decision making might have on the nervous system. Well, no, I have not, but that doesn't mean I won't comment on this. So the, uh, there is a a, uh, uh, a YouTube that I did with David Bricelli who created TRE, and it's called Polyvagal Theory and Spirituality. But it's the same, it's going to give the same answer that when our nervous system is in a state of safety, then the ethical considerations, the spiritual ones, and the relationship with others is very different than when our nervous system is in a state of threat. And I think the yoga, underlying yoga philosophy, and the ethics that she's referring to would, power, would, would be consistent. Okay, thank you. It, it, but it would be consistent, but not as detailed or worked out. So I'm basically saying here are the principles, but they're, the actual system isn't there. I mean, someone would have to do that literature, right. write, that paper, write that paper. Right, okay. You did mention that that, that portion was driven by your, by your associate who... who yeah. yeah, yeah. And more or less has written several books, at least two books that I know of, on yoga and yoga therapy. And she's a good scholar as well as an amazing, you know, yoga person. Wonderful. Thank you. This is an interesting question. Um, I, it's from Ginny who asks, how do you create opportunities for polyvagal safety for folks who continue to be impacted by the dominant culture's oppression and systemic racism? Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm all, I'm, you know, am I speechless? It, the, the issue is, uh, I was given this is a common type question that I would, this is what people were asking me similar questions like, how do they deal with relatives who are uh, followers of Trump? How, how can they have an interaction with those people? And my comment to all that is the worst thing is to try to argue the points. And I basically emphasize that what people really want is to, is to be heard. They want their voice heard. The problem is listening to some of these voices are triggers to so many of us, and that makes it very difficult. 
I, I will tell you a little story uh, about how I dealt with this in one situation. A, uh, we were moving and the, and the uh, moving van came in and the driver came in and he looked at me and he said, you look like an academic. And usually when someone says that, you think it's a compliment or something. I said, yeah, I'm an academic. He says, well, I don't like academics. <laughs> and, and, I, and I said, you know, tell me why. He says, well, they have these liberal viewpoints. They're trying to, I don't want my kids to go to college. They'll end up with these viewpoints, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, I tried to probe him with uh, a minimum wage type question. Ah, there, you know, start going. So he bought the whole thing. And then I just listened. And he rambled and vented for a while. And he left. He moved them to it. And then he, my wife was meeting the truck at, at the new house. He comes in and he says, I had really a great conversation with your husband. The point was that I didn't argue with him. I listened to him. And I think it's the listening that we need to learn, the witnessing of another. I'm not saying it's easy because we all are, in a sense, uh, we're triggered by these comments. They make us feel bad and we get angry. But what I'm saying is our physiology is becoming aggressive and defensive. So there is no space for the human to human interaction. But if we can witness, we can calm. And when we calm, then it becomes flexibility because that physiological state of inviting that social engagement system in creates a flexibility of co-regulation to occur. I'm not guaranteeing it. I'm saying it, the, the opportunity, you have to have that calm physiological state to, to go somewhere. You're not going to convince anyone, not now. I think that's part of the lessons that we're learning. And it doesn't appear that you convince people with information. Thank you. This is an interesting question from Shannon. She asks, how do antidepressants affect the vagus nerve? Um, it's a good, good question. Uh, we did one study uh, a few decades ago, and the effect of it really appeared. It, uh, okay. In some people, it has the effectiveness of the drug seemed to be related to whether or not it affected the vagus, meaning if it resulted in a depression of the vagal activity, the drugs didn't work. So there is some literature on that. So the, the question is, it doesn't increase the vagal activity. It's going from a different mechanism. But sometimes these drugs actually interfere. They have uh, anticholinergic, which is a neurotransmitter to vagus. They have a degree of blocking how the vagus works. So they're actually become paradoxical. They, as it's removed the capacity of the vagal break while trying to stimulate higher brain structures that would reduce anxiety. So the, the answer is that first of all, the literature is not well developed on that question. The other point is that it would be interesting, again, taking a polyvagal perspective, that if one measured that intervening variable, that physiological state, and then made predictions on outcome uh, by the degree that the vagus was effective or not effective. Thanks. There's a question. I think this will be the last from our audience. Thanks, everybody, for the great questions. This is from Lee, who asks, how do you strengthen vagal tone with people who feel unsafe in their bodies or struggle with yoga, deep breathing, or mm. other physical signaling? Well, I think bringing it up in the yoga community is an important question because many people gravitate to yoga to, for multiple things, to feel better and a little bit to feel better within a safe community. So you start having all these things going on. Yet people who walk into the studio with severe trauma histories, uh, certain manipulations, including breathing, become triggers. Uh, closing one's eyes can be a trigger. So there is, uh, okay, one might want a personal, personalized way of dealing with those who are aware enough that their body is that fragile. Uh, but the, the question is, uh, uh, it's a good question of, uh, not everyone comes into these environments 
with a neural accessibility or neurally welcoming what's going on. So the neural exercises uh, are playfulness, social engagement, or uh, part of the neural exercise that could be uh, recruited for these uh, individuals who have difficulty is uh, breathing exercises until they become destabilizing and then movement. So you give them toolkits to experience their body. So if you're doing slow exhalations or slow breathing patterns and the body says, can't go there, well, then you move and then you go back to it again. So in a sense, giving agency or control to the client about their physiological state, even though they can't go into true states of prolonged safety. Okay, thank you. Now, I'd, I'd like to just hear a little bit before we close about, first of all, where you're focusing your efforts going forward and also a bit of the safe and sound protocol. Yeah, well, uh, let, let, let's talk safe and sound first. Safe and sound protocol is really based on neuroception of safety. So what happens to a nervous system when it's being, uh, when cues of safety are being delivered acoustically in, in a program that is functionally like a treadmill. It's like a neural exercise and where the frequency band of perceptual advantage is being expanded and contracted and exercised. And it's, it's based on the premise that you can get this acoustic simulation in, and then the cortex interprets it, and then it comes back down into the ventral vagal complex, regulating the glial muscles, but also regulating cardio inhibitory, the vagal. So it becomes a vagal, acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. And actually received the patent for that claim. So, and and it, many people report this calmingness, but what seems to be universal is the face lightens up. So you start in a sense, so when the middle of your muscles are working, the upper part of the face starts becoming more dynamic. So people see it. Again, it's a lot of things that we never knew how to quantify. We just, I like that person's smile. We didn't know what we were looking at. But you can see it changing, and then you know what you're looking at. So that's the safe and sound protocol. It's a theory driven based on the neuroception of acoustic stimuli that are functionally female voices uh, within the perceptual band. The, 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 the frequency band of perceptual advantage, and uh, which is really the frequencies that we as humans use for social communication. So high and low frequencies are just taken out of the program. So, and it, it's, it's just a visualize a, a, an exercise system. Now, the other question is, where, I mean, there's so much application for all of your oh, studies. I mean, what, oh, are you, what are you focusing on going Oh, on? well, we created a not-for-profit called the Polyvagal Institute. And that is really developing educational materials. Uh, in it, uh, educational materials in various fields, including education, medicine, uh, mental health, of course, yoga. Uh, there's, in a sense, we're developing it. even architecture. So there are now some like three or four architects who are polyvagal informed, who want to get this the notion of space as healing within in, in the curriculum of, of that. I'm really also working with a, uh, a healthcare system to transform their clinics into becoming polyvagal informed clinics, which means to be more welcoming, more shared journey of wellness, the environment would be less evaluative. Uh, it's a big challenge because we're doing these things, but uh, this group wants to do it, so we're excited by it. So my uh, my goals, which is really what you're asking, is to, I really would like to see uh, polyvagal theory have impact on the educational system, on how children are treated, uh, and how schools are organized. They can't be so uh, in a sense, uh, top down, you have to sit in a room, you have to have an understanding of what the nervous system can handle, and they have to have be more fun for the child. So in a sense, schools seem to have given up the, the power of play. And the power of play provides you with the resource 
to be resilient and to sit still for several hours. And they pushed that out and wanted them to sit still. And they, they, they got the kids who can't sit still. And now they're trying to functionally use pharmaceuticals or get them out of their school systems. So because the underlying physiology of the child within the context of schools is not very easily regulated. Remember, schools are not safe either. There's shaming, there's bullying, and there are threats. So education, medicine are big on my agenda uh, where I'm working. That's where I'm working on. That's wonderful. Very wonderful. Now, if people want to learn more about you, can where can they go? They should go to Polyvagal, uh, it's Polyvagal Institute, one word, dot org to see that webpage. And they can also go to my own webpage, stephenporches.com. And uh, there'll, there'll be information. On Polyvagal Institute, the whole idea was to create a niches. So we actually have affinity groups where people are joining to create community. So there's a there's a self-organizing yoga group on there now with, uh, I don't know, maybe 200 people now. So it's, it's quite ex exciting to watch these areas grow and people talk to each other and become innovative. Uh, so the, the, my final comment, or let's say, I'm assuming it's my final comment, is that polyvagal theory is a theory that is to be applied, is to be expanded, is to be modified for various needs. It's a set of principles. So the second really major paper that I wrote on polyvagal theory, I didn't even call it polyvagal theory. I called it polyvagal perspective because I want to emphasize this importance of our physiological state in the world that we live in. Beautiful. Dr. Stephen Porges, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Ross. It's been an interesting hour, and thank you for the good questions and for leading me through, through that. Thank you. Wishing everyone a wonderful day. Thanks to Jacob, our producer, and everyone in the Banyan Book community. Dr. Forge's book is called Polyvagal Safety, Attachment, Communication, and Self-Regulation. Thanks again, Dr. Forge. Thank you. You're welcome.